dear alumni, members of the campus community, and friends. The Women Leadership and Philanthropy Group of New York, um, entitled WPNY, is very pleased to be sponsoring the webcast about women leaders in higher education, presented by both the Faculty of Dentistry and McGill Graduate and Postdoctoral Studies during At Home Homecoming 2020. I'm Libna Faruqi, and I'm a graduate of McGill's Faculty of Law. And I'm also the co-chair of the Women Leadership and Philanthropy Group of New York. I'm very pleased that our group has the opportunity to present this topic to you. And I will introduce the session's moderator and speaker in just a couple of minutes. The WLPNY is a group of diverse McGill alumni working across many fields of employment, law, science, banking, and many more. This group was launched in early 2019, and our goal is to connect with McGill alumni within the New York region, facilitating the exchange of information, experiences, and inspiring, and learning from each other. We seek to promote leadership through meaningful engagement opportunities with alumni and students and communicate philanthropic opportunities that both resonate with and have a direct impact on women within the McGill community. We recently launched a fundraising project around the WLP NY Bursary for Women, studying in underrepresented disciplines. We're seeking to have a bursary to be endowed at the cost of $150,000. This fund would be used to provide bursaries based on financial need with a preference for women who are studying in a discipline or concentration where women are underrepresented. More information will follow after the webcast via email. With that being said, last year McGill launched Made by McGill, the campaign for our third century. And this campaign is squarely aimed at tackling some of the key social, key social economic, environmental, and technological changes we face as a society. I'm not sure how more relevant that can be today. There's never been a better time for our university and for the students, staff, faculty, and alumni to come together to take on the pressing challenges which face all of us. Today's topic of understanding the successes and challenges faced by women leaders in higher education is important and relevant because it helps open the doors to a diverse education it expands the range of perspectives on our campuses and maximizes the opportunities for exchanges of ideas within a vibrant intellectual community. This therefore brings me to the introduction of today's moderator and guest speakers. Our speakers today are Dr. Ilham Imami, Dean of the Faculty, uh, Dean of McGill Faculty of Dentistry, and Dr. Josephine Nalbin Toglu. Dean of McGill Graduate and Postdoctoral Studies. Dr. Ilham Imami is an internationally recognized clinical scientist who has dedicated her career to the promotion of oral health through service, education, and research. She is a firm believer in the art of collaboration and teamwork and is an advocate for diversity and cultural values. Upon arrival, upon her arrival in Canada, uh, in 2002, Dr. Imami had 17 years of experience in public and private general dental practice in Iran. She rapidly became an influential clinician scientist pursuing her MSc in prosthodontics and PhD in biomedical science in Montreal. As Dean of Faculty of Dentistry since 2018, Dr. Imami brings 35 years of experience in the dental profession and academia. Dr. Josephine Nelvin Toglu has served as Dean of Graduate and Postdoctoral Studies at McGill University since 2015. Prior to her appointment, she was the Director of the Integrated Program of Neuroscience, which is not only McGill's largest graduate program, but also Canada's graduate neuroscience program. Dr. Nelvin Toglu has spearheaded the development of interdisciplinary, interfaculty graduate programs and expanded McGill's international partnerships through new joint and dual degrees. Dr. Nalvin Toglu is a McGill alumnus, having earned her BSc and PhD in biochemistry. 
Highlighting today's questions and discussion is our moderator, Dr. Linda Lubin Jerome. She's currently a second year master's student in dentistry at McGill University with a keen interest in global oral health care equity. Dr. Lubin Jerome has worked as a dentist for more than 20 years in Haiti and also taught prosthodontics at Haiti University School of Dentistry. After the 2010 earthquake, she decided not to rebuild her practice and traveled to North America to study and to take a closer look at managing access to oral health care. So with that said, welcome again to all, and I'll now turn the presentation over to our speakers. Thank you. Thank you, Lobna, for this introduction. Welcome again, Jill and Manu, and Jill Nabantoglu. Welcome to you watching this webinar. As professors, both Dean Emami and Dean Nalban Trogdu have transitioned from researchers into administrators, both leaders in their respective units. Their competencies in research have guided them in their career trajectory. And through their transitions, they have identified a number of keys to success. One, mindset of endurance and ambition. Two, influential mentorship. And finally, the importance of empathy. Let's now get their perspective on this point. This is the first question. After completing your PhD, what was your experience finding your first professional position? Did you find that being a woman either positively or negatively influenced your search in a field that was historically male dominated? So maybe I'll answer that question. I had a very typical uh, trajectory. Uh, after the PhD was a postdoctoral fellowship and I took that as the occasion to experience different environments. Uh, a lot of our students, and myself included, go away. So I spent my uh, about three and a half years in London, England uh, at a cancer research uh, institute. It was a very renowned institute. So there were postdocs from all over the world there. And in terms of gender balance, I mean, we were 50-50, you know, we, uh, it was very exciting times. Uh, and it was really a very good developmental uh, time. But if I look back, it's really very evident that all the principal investigators, everyone who was leading research groups were male. There was not a single woman. There were, there were lots of women researchers, but not a single uh, woman. And the, it was very easy for us to achieve whatever we wanted to do. Uh, so it, you know, no barriers really came to mind. And from there, I went on to uh, start working in a lab uh, in Montreal. And typically I applied for scholarships, for salary awards, for grants, and I set up uh, my own lab. Um, so it, it seemed pretty smooth. It's the same anxieties as every student, but it was quite smooth. Um, mine was quite different, and uh, so so I was lucky enough to have an academic job offer before finishing my PhD program. So I really don't think my gender had an impact on my career at that point. And I firmly believe that the main ingredients for my own success were my transversal knowledge, and that was due to my diverse educational background as a dentist, a clinician scientist, and uh, doing like a PhD that was in, in biomedical science, and then my postdocs that there were each of them different than the others. So, and I think the hard work, dedication, ambition, perseverance, and not being scared of failures at that time really helped me to to have my academic job quite uh, very, actually, quickly. Okay. 
Thank you, Dr. Imami. Uh, we know that research skills can help in academic careers or administrators' uh, careers as administrators. The next question will be about research, how you get help, how research helps you through your career. Before becoming deans, you both began your careers in higher education as researchers and professors. Research is difficult work and requires dedication, commitment, critical thinking, project management, and analytical skills. Would you say that these skills help you during your deanship? And if so, how and why? Maybe I can jump in because I went, I always worked in a lab, right? Postdoc, setting up my own lab. And none of us really get training when we were students in this. That's why, I mean, <laughs> we can talk about this later on, but this is, these are the skills I'd like to give to our students <laughs> presently. Mm -hmm. So the training, like there was no management skills, but I had to set up a lab. I had to hire people. And part of it is the difficulty is not in hiring people, but it's in working with them, right? Learning to motivate different personalities, getting them to produce uh, and succeed. So that's um, a big learning uh, lesson uh, for all of life, I think. Um, setting timelines, you know, in research, what do we do? We set timelines, we have deliverables, uh, you have objectives and you have to deliver on your objectives because you're constantly being evaluated. So I always felt as though I was a small business owner who was on the verge of bankruptcy. <laughs> and I was, I've said this my entire life. I've gone from grant to grant to grant. So you really have to manage people properly so that you all succeed so that the small business remains active and alive, right? And to do this, you always have to have a plan B, plan C, plan Z, and you develop resilience during that. So I think just running a lab with all of these things, the time management, people management, and having keeping your eye on the ball of what you're trying to deliver. Uh, that's really what I've used in the past five years as Dean of Grad Studies. Mm -hmm. I agree totally with uh, Josephine. I think uh, what she mentioned, actually I use also uh, my experience of having a research lab, working with people, some I'm doing administration within the, your lab, was really helpful. And also when I accepted actually my job offer as a dean, I use a qualitative research skill, what I have learned through my, one of my postdocs, uh, the tools, the analytical approach to have really a deep understanding of my work environment and to explore the perspective of my future colleagues. And I agree with uh, Josephine that research increases our resiliency and our patience in face of challenges, as well as I think our curiosity toward finding solutions. So as a dean, you should also be able to know how to promote research in your own faculty. And I think it is really advantageous to be familiar with different funding policies, agencies, grant opportunities, to advise your faculty and your graduate students. Also, I think research knowledge uh, help in negotiation with senior administration for increasing research building capacity, hiring a new researcher in your faculty. And sometime I say, even to protect the rights of your academic staff. So you, I, I totally agree. We need this research knowledge in administration. It is very helpful. But if I can just interject, I think the problem solving, like you come into a new position mm -hmm. and 
you have to be excellent at problem solving. You have to enjoy exactly. solving problems, actually. <laughs> yeah, this is, I think, a day-to-day -day, uh, activity <laughs> as a dean and as any manager, I think this is what we need, finding solutions. Uh, thank you so much, both, both of you. Finding solutions uh, from research skills. Uh, now we are heading to the third question. And uh, Statistic Canada has reported that in Canadian universities, the proportion of female deans has risen from 5% in 1971, 1972, to 38% in 2018, 2019. Currently at McGill, 58% of deans are female, eight out of 40. Based on your experience, what do you think has contributed to an increase in the proportion of female deans in Canadian universities? And what motivated you to take on the role of dean? I think actually this uh, recent policies toward diversity, equity, and inclusion have had an impact on the increased number of women in leadership positions. However, uh, women have been also encouraged to take a leadership role because they have shown their achievements in terms of their education, their uh, multitasking capacities, their talents in long-term vision and strategic planning, as well as their strong attribute of paying attention to details. As you all know, the devil is in the details. So, uh, and I think that this is why we are seeing more and more uh, like a woman in a leadership position. What do you think, Josephine? So, look, I have a perspective. We have two different backgrounds here. Elham came from outside McGill, and I'm a <laughs> lifelong McGiller. So I've looked, <laughs> I've observed what's happened in our own institution. And what I've noticed is that over the years, a, a new level was created in the administration, right? At the faculty level. Uh, and I think faculty of medicine might have been the first one at this. They started having associate deans for multiple positions. And in a lot of cases, these associate deans were women. And it gave them visibility and they were amazingly competent. So it got to the point where at some point we used to joke, well, if you need to get something done, give it to a woman, <laughs> make her an associate dean. And this visibility really raised them, you know, and it helped the entire community showing how good women are at navigating, uh, you know, interpersonal relationships, uh, complex situations. They are detail oriented. Um, they have a lot of empathy. Uh, so we ended up getting these role models, but it was always, hmm, you're kind of stuck at that level. And then all of a sudden, <laughs> we went to 50% female deans. Well, we had two female principals, so that helped uh, in a row. And now, like, we're 50% female deans. So around that table, there are a lot of women, and it's, it's a different voice, and it's a good voice. Um, and... I was never an associate dean, but I ran a very large graduate program and I took the job because I thought I could make a difference. You know, I think most of us take on jobs because we think we can make a difference, that, that we can solve the problem that we see is present and we want to tackle it. We want that challenge. Mm -hmm. To be honest with you, a dean shin role was not really in my career plan. <laughs> and I was, no. I was strongly encouraged by few key leaders to take this role. So, however, I'm really happy now. I'm very proud to be the first woman dean in the history of the Faculty of Dentistry at McGill. 
um, because I think this position gave me the opportunity to fight against unconscious bias uh, in different ways. And unfortunately, I have to say that boys club, gender disparity and racism is still exist in North America and other parts of the world. And uh, I'm happy to be at McGill, an institution that supports uh, advocacy for uh, women and racialized groups. So I think this is very important for me. Thank you, both of you. Uh, for myself, I want to congratulate McGill University for the increasing presence of women in leadership positions while wishing for a future in which there would be more ethnic diversity represented. That being said, let's talk about mentorship. It could be a good key for success. Who were your mentors? In what role did they play in influencing your career trajectory? I did not have mentors. <laughs> so let's start it that way. Oh. Okay. <laughs> I, uh, well, I had the type of career, I was always in research, but I always changed my research um, subject. So, you know, I would work with a group of people, but then I would switch uh, what I was doing. Uh, I needed a lot of change uh, in terms of the scientific uh, questions uh, that I was addressing. I just followed my interest wherever I could go. So I didn't really keep mentors from one stage to another. But at all levels, as I was making decisions, there were uh, really good people that I could consult, uh, bounce off ideas, uh, people I respected, and the, some of the reasons that my career went where they went was because of the advice I got. Uh, and initially, I'd say when I first started my lab, um, I was at the Montreal Neurological Institute, and I think there were like two or three women um, principal investigators, and I really used them as sounding boards to figure out how to navigate uh, it was an old boys club so navigate that uh, but then later on it was um, people who were in administration as i moved in administration as i became a graduate program director as i went uh became dean it was people would come up to me and offer me a position and it was like oh i never considered this so i would uh have colleagues who were uh, the, whom I respected and who were very straightforward and you know who I trusted uh, their opinion, uh, but I didn't have. I mean, I really envy people who have a mentor throughout life. Uh, a lot of times, a supervisor can be a mentor throughout life, and I've tried since then. You know, especially in my role as graduate program director and now as dean, uh, I've spent a lot of time. Uh, interacting and the interaction ends up turning into mentorship because I still have students, my own students, students from the programs, McGill students contacting me all the time. Uh, and it gives me great satisfaction seeing how well they do uh, at the end. Not always on my advice, but it's just to open doors, support them and validate their own feelings uh, about what they think they can do. Mm -hmm. Maybe I would like to share also my point of view of who is a mentor. Um, so a mentor, it is a person that uh, gives you job advice or other advices, but it also uh, lets you know what are your weakness, weaknesses. So criticize you, encourage you toward big challenges. Um, and this is very important to have uh, these uh, criticism because without that you cannot grow so my influential mentor who really changed my career path was my PhD supervisor and uh, I was at the faculty of dentistry at McGill uh, 
uh, and my uh, career trajectory toward academic life started with a simple email that I received from her. So it was a link for an award competition. And although at that time, I really didn't know how this competition would change my life. I followed her advice up and applied for this competitive salary award. And because at that time, I didn't have even enough knowledge of this kind of competition, I was relaxed and I did like really for me, you know, when I am not looking at this um, proposal and I sh want to share it with some of my students, I say, but now I think it's not really good what I wrote. But at that time, uh, it happens that uh, I got this award and that was it was very competitive and it open doors for my future academic job. And that I see really like my mentor uh, did that for me. Great, great for people who have a mentor. If you don't have one, maybe it's time to look for one. Mm -hmm. My next question will be for Dr. Nalman Dublu. As the Dean of Graduate, and postdoctoral studies. What characteristic would you recommend to make to look for in a supervisor? That's a really good question because uh, people write to me all the time, how do I approach a supervisor? What should I do? And, and I've got to tell you, like McGill is a very research intensive university, right? So what attracts students to us is the research. So they get really, really excited by an individual's, by a professor's research, and they absolutely want to be doing that. And, and I think that's terrific. Uh, that's how we recruit top students. But what I always tell them is also to talk to the person, because it's not just at the level of research, right? I mean, we, we've just come from mentorship. So what is the relationship? Can you develop a relationship with this person? We don't always get along with everybody, right? And if you're coming in to do long-term research, you know, three to five years, that's a big chunk of your life. And you got to feel very comfortable working with the supervisor. And it's something that I call fit. You know, you can have a superb researcher who's going to have a terrific fit with one group of students and not with another group of students. And that's something that students need to discover at the very beginning. So we always tell them to have these conversations with the supervisor. We know the research is great. You're going to do fine. But it's five years of almost daily interaction. And what are your expectations? You know, like clarify your expectations towards what the supervisor will be providing you. And the same thing for the supervisor. What is it that you expect uh, from the student? Um, Will you be helping them get the conferences? Will you be helping them in their professional development? Or you just say, no, I'm here for research. So these are the things that you need to discover and you need to discover these early, not a year or two years uh, into your degree. So what we've instituted at McGill is something that we call the letter of understanding. And it's not scary. It's not a contract. It's just a standardized way of, addressing some questions and having a conversation, a discussion about long-term planning, long-term prospects uh, for the student and for the supervisor, what they want to achieve together and to see whether their way of working meshes. You know, it, that's really important but because that's what success is. And when, it, when that works, it's tremendous and you do have a lifelong uh, mentor uh, at the end. So this is really an eye opener for most people. So we've had it for over a year now. It's mandated for all uh, doctoral students. Like when I make things mandated, it's, it's a dirty word, but people are getting used to it and they really like having the conversation very, very early on because we're all very busy. You come in, you start courses, you start your projects and you don't have time to establish that personal relationship. And I think that's what's very important. Thank you for your answers. Uh, you, you want Sorry. to add something? Uh, maybe I want just to add something on that. Sometimes it's good you just go to a research lab and you work for one month, two months, now as a summer research project. 
And this is where you can also see if this lab or if this a supervisor is really the one that you are looking for. This gives you this opportunity to have an overview of this person that you want to work maybe for five years. So that, that is something that uh, actually in my research lab, I, uh, promo I promoted. Now I'm doing less supervision because of my job as a dean, but it was very good strategy, I think, uh, for myself and also for my students. Uh, I can add something. In my case, I had a reading class with my actual supervisor. Then after that, we felt that we should continue working together. That's so, right. This is... Uh, um, we talked about great research skills and uh, relationship with uh, mentors as keys to success. What about empathy? Uh, my first question is for both of you. How has the pandemic changed or influenced your perspective of your administrative role? What are the most important factors to consider when making decisions that affect students or professions? Wow, you know, I think people have to understand that as a university, especially in March, we lived chaos. <laughs> Every day was 24 hours of chaos. And, and we had to stop doing what we were doing. Like, you know, the routine, what we're used to, the processes, the protocols that we have. And I think that's been the most important thing I've learned is like to stop and really consider the situation. Um, we we were thinking, what is our community living? You know, like the students who are going through this, the supervisors who had had closed labs, what were they going through? So we did everything then to just modify our processes so that we didn't want to add to the stress level uh, in the community. So it was everything that we were doing was to think, okay, how can we just lower the anxiety level? We did lots of webinars, workshops, drop-ins. We were available there to answer all questions. And we were much more flexible in our expectations from everyone, from students, supervisors. And we have to be also flexible about our expectations from ourselves, right? <laughs> and it was just the flexibility and I think the phrase I used the most was, okay, let's lower the anxiety level. Let's lower the anxiety level. So it was really the empathy came to the surface. I think we're all have a lot of empathy, but in this one, it was really the goal uh, all the time to think about the community and just support them through this, as opposed to saying, well, you have to fit our mold. These are our rules. And, you know, you can, you still have to do whatever we expect you to do. So it was uh, very much flexibility. I totally agree. Uh, in fact, this pandemic has challenged all of us to rise to the next level of our potential in terms of crisis management, effective communication, and rapid adaptation to change. So we have had to rally our teams and to discuss, collaborate even with policymaker and governmental bodies for wise and strategic decision-making. And also to turn adversities into great opportunities. Um, and for me, really the safety and health of our society, the delivery of our academic programs within the norm of excellence, the well-being and mental health of our students, our staff, our professors, and operation within the new economic circumstances. Uh, they are actually the most important factor that plays a role in my day-to-day decision-making. And um, I think this pandemic had uh, some good, actually, uh, and positive impact as a uh, Josephine mentioned in even in our own ways of doing things. I have changed some of my way of doing during this pandemic. And now 
you know, I see that is good. I am enjoying somehow. I was actually mentioning to uh, my assistant that between the two meetings that I had was only 15 minutes. And I decided to do a cake for my husband for a lunch for the first time, maybe in my whole uh, life of being with him. And I, it, you know, it was very joyful. And these are the new things that I think we are also um, like experiencing within this pandemic. And I think this is for everybody. Uh, uh, like this. So yes, it is a challenging time, but at the same time, you know, there are some new things that we didn't have time to pay attention and now we are doing. I think Miguel really responded very well. Like we pivoted so well. It, I am amazed at how well we did as a community. I mean, having lived it like every day, <laughs> As I said, it was chaos. It was terrible. But just stepping back and looking at it, I mean, I'm proud of how we, what we did to, to get to this point. And the other thing I realized is that, as Elham was saying, there's certain things we're never going to go back to. <laughs> We've discovered better ways of doing it, and we're going to implement them going forward because it makes so much more sense. Sometimes I go why were we doing this? Like, why were we so attached to this process? Because when we had to change it, we changed it. Everybody got used to it. And it was an eye opener. So we're gonna, it's gonna, we're gonna get out of this much, much stronger. Oh, thank you both of you. Um, from keys to success, we are moving quickly to barriers <laughs> that, both of you maybe are facing. Uh, the question is, can you speak to any barriers you have faced when choosing to pursue your graduate studies or your career in higher education? How did you overcome them? You know, I think people can talk about lots of different barriers. Um, I think in, in my case, and maybe it's in the case of a, a lot of other women, it's a self-generated barrier. Like you've got to realize my generation was the one that was told you can have it all. Okay, so that's how I was raised. Every All doors were open to me, I could have it all. And then you start going through your work life and you go, oh, but I'm not having it all at the same time. Like it's... <laughs> I'm not slicing my day, work, and then personal life. You know, it's it's not even all the time. And I've seen people who can't cope with that and say, well, this isn't what I expected. So this isn't for me. I mean, I think you can have it all at different times, you know, mm -hmm. and, and the different times are not like years apart. It's just that you've got to know that to succeed, sometimes you put the focus on work, you know, You've got a grant that you're writing. I mean, Elham knows this, right? So when we're writing a grant, we're like completely immersed in that mm -hmm. and nothing else. You've got a child who's sick. Well, you're taking care of that child. And I've always felt very fortunate that I was in research because I basically had my own hours, right? You set your own hours. So you work the hours you want. It also allows you to work too many hours. I mean, <laughs> you've got to stay away from that. But that freedom really helps. Uh, but it's just to know that there is a, an idealistic view out there of exact work balance and having it all that doesn't necessarily apply in the regular life. And as long as you accept that, I think you can find your way through all the problems. Yeah, I agree uh, with you totally. And actually maybe I can share my kind of own experience because I did my uh, DMD uh, when I was uh, 25 years old. So I finished my DMD at 25 years old and then I started working as a dentist. 
Then at age 40, uh, when I immigrated to Canada, I decided to do a specialty in dentistry. And then at, just at the end of this program, I said, and I was always in love with doing more education, having PhD, I said, okay, I will go for this and I will do my PhD. So as you can see, at different stage, I had different barriers. But when I uh, started my master in Canada and my PhD, uh, financial challenges was an issue for me as an immigrant, for sure. And at that time, I can say uh, scholarship awards really helped me. Um, and another issue that uh, Josephine highlighted is a work-life balance. And then this work-life balance, the way that you do, it really also depends to your age. Uh, so for me, I think one thing that was very important all of my career is the support that I had from my partner and then my family, my daughter. Um, and I think it's important when you are choosing your life partner, it is important to see if this person is somebody that will support you on your profession. I think this is very important. And uh, then the things will be, I think, easier. Uh, that was for me, actually. That was the way that I overcome this work-life balance. And it's still, it still is... Uh, you know, doing this work-life balance, being a dean, is not a very easy task. But uh, when you have this understanding within you, your family, I think you can manage it easily and enjoy both, the, both of this time, either working or being uh, at home. So I think, go, I mean, going back, I, I think we're probably of the generation that we were never told you can't do this, mm -hmm. you know? like. So you, you find barriers and we just looked at the challenges and tried to overcome them. Uh, but the present generation might be different uh, because I think it's getting harder and harder for them. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, maybe ours was more idealistic. Mm -hmm. We are moving to our last topic, which is opportunities. What does McGill offer graduate students to help them transition to careers or to develop skills? That's a really good question. And, and we worked a lot uh, on this at McGill. I mean, for example, McGill was really the first university to have a professional development program for graduate students. And they launched this in 2008 and it's skill sets. So it's a whole series of workshops on anything that you want to uh, discover and you want to explore. But what we've done uh, since then is that we've produced a framework so that the uh, workshops can fit under really specific categories. You know, you want to do increase your communication skills. So you know where to find that workshop, uh, leading teams or for your well being. So there are lots of these workshops, but they're more curated now so that you can decide for yourself what you're going to be getting uh, your skills in. And just recently, we've launched something called My Path. And this is a way to develop what's called or to really come up with an individual development plan. Okay, so it's programming that allows you to reflect on what you want to do, set goals, Realize that you don't have the skills, but we're offering all these workshops for you to develop those skills. Get that and iterative process, right? You keep doing it for whatever goal you have, whatever skill you have. So we've made my path mandatory <laughs> again for doctoral students. And they started the first year of their studies. So it's not at the end, you know, as they're writing their thesis and saying, what am I going to do? What do I have? You know? And what my path and all the reflection process uh, provides is that they also realize all the skills that they have learned just doing their research, right? Now they can articulate what they've learned. They've learned project management. Mm -hmm. They have all these critical and analytical thinking that 
the entire world needs, right? I mean, if we are in a knowledge-based uh, economy, who best to run that economy? Higher edu- you know, students in higher education who get this every day is just to make them realize that they're actually getting it. And this uh, individual development plan is for them to really acknowledge it and own uh, what they know. So this is also part of recognizing their strengths, you know, overcoming the weaknesses. Uh, and we're really proud of this. Uh, so it's we've come a long way. 2008 started with the professional development, but like now we've got a big framework of having the students use it throughout their degree. And this isn't just for the, I mean, we've made it mandatory for doctoral because I want them to start thinking about it first year, but this is open to everyone, master's students, postdocs, everyone at McGill. Uh, I want to thank both Dr. Imani and Dr. Nalbantudu for joining us today and for a great presentation. Thank, thank you also for those behind the scene, especially Julie and Davina. Special, a special thank to all of you for joining us for this uh, session. I hope to see you, all of you again, in the near future. Thank you.